Thank you, Travis. Yeah. Thank everyone for joining. Good morning. Hope you have your coffee and your tea. Please mute and turn off your video. Thank you. Anywho, as we wait another two minutes for anyone else to join, negotiating team, what are we doing for Thanksgiving this year? Other than sleeping. <laughs> um, cooking that, for two. Actually... Cooking for two. Cooking for two. Stacey, what were you saying? I, I am, in fact, actually sleeping on Thanksgiving. My family does Thanksgiving the Saturday after. Um but I have to bake pies also for my neighbors and my super. So I will do the baking on Wednesday and I will spend Tuesday uh, napping and answering uh, questions on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. Brendan, are you doing anything? Are you flying or are you, are you home? You're not flying. No, I'm, I'm a home uh, uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll be done as a family a small celebration but uh i'm trying to get a contract ratified that's, that's my <laughs> main objective these days so, uh, so uh, you're we'll, gonna have we'll, a turkey we'll, leg in one hand and the we'll contract take, in the other we'll, we'll take a we'll, we'll probably take a short break uh on thursday but we'll be we'll be back at it it's so funny yeah, I think I'm helping. Um, I'll be in San Francisco if I'm feeling well enough um, tomorrow morning to fly. But I'll be in San Francisco helping out a someone pass out a lot of meals to uh, the community. I don't know if it's the homeless community in San Francisco or if we're doing um, the LGBTQ version of Meals on Wheels. I I I was just volunteered. I was like, I, I spend my um, Thanksgiving with them every year. And like, they just, when I tell them I'm coming, they're like, here's what we're doing this year. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so well, one way or another, you'll be busy. We're cooking, yeah, we're cooking meals and then handing them out, basically. That's awesome. Good for Stacey, you. Stacey, I'm still thinking about <laughs> that thing you sent me with the pot. <laughs> <laughs> the frying pan. All right. I am excited to do my annual pie baking bonanza. That'll be the first cooking I've done in a while. I've been, my kitchen is forsaken. It's all been, you know, takeout and grabbing stuff on the fly. So Ooh, you're telling me it'll, it'll be nice. All right. It's 10 5 AM. We're going to get started. This may be a little bit shorter of a town hall. This is going to be our fifth TA2 tap town hall, 10 AM on 11, 23, 21. We thank everyone for joining. And we also thank our negotiating team member who are in attendance to help um, give us clarifying information as it relates to our TA2. Sonia is not here for this town hall. She had a previous obligation um, and is, has excused herself from this specific town hall. She'll be back at the next one. Um, so we're gonna get started. I have no housekeeping notes for today other than the fact that I will continue to memorialize for everyone to um, go to the YouTube and subscribe to our um, JetBlue TWIFC channel. And um, for those who miss any town halls, those town halls will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Um, so we're gonna start with our article unpacking. We're gonna go with uh, Ernesto is opening up our town hall today. He's going to be doing leaves of absence. That is article 25 in our hymnal page 121. And I'm going to pass it off to Ernesto. Ernesto actually is our Orlando negotiating team representative. Good morning, Ernesto. Thank you. Good morning. Audio check. You all hear me? Yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you, Taisha, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, I'm happy actually to present this particular article 
uh, leaves of absence. Uh, article number 25, as Taisha said, is page 121, if you want to reference it. Um, although not an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly excuse me, uh, long article, it is one of these that, you know, as we know, obviously the TA itself, you know, this can be a lot of overwhelming info to kind of digest. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes it overwhelms me when I have to go back and read and read through things. But, and as is the case, you know, there's some articles in here that, you know, may interest one person or be of a, you know, high importance and then to another, not so much, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, this particular article, I think, um, is, or I would hope would be of extreme importance uh, equally across the board to our to our work group because this one pretty much um, highlights how life can happen to us on any given day, you know? So um, again, I'm very happy. Also, I apologize in advance, um, you know, as, as we, you know, obviously our TA, we reference in flight crew member by IFC, but I have this thing in my, in, in my brain, like, well, the wires that connect my eyes to my brain and brain to my wires. When I read IFC, I right away replace with I because I know I'm an in-flight crew member. So it's like I'm talking about myself. So bail me. I apologize if um if those wires cause me to trip up a lot. I was trying to read this last night and earlier today and I kept catching myself. And I gotta get my reading glasses. I oh they're around my neck. I started wearing reading glasses this year. <laughs> I couldn't get my arms to get any longer, so I had to give in. Um, I want to uh, just open up real quick, uh, just with the uh, actual article opener, just verbatim, so we can kind of get that um, get that on the way, get us rolling. So, in-flight crew members shall be free from duty during all leaves identified in this section. Um, an in-flight crew member may not engage in aviation employment other than military service while on leave of absence with the advance permission of the company. Um, in notification to union, the company shall notify local presidents, local president of our union. Um, if the one we ratify, ratify the contract, we'll have our own local union president. Uh, we'll notify them or their designee when a personal, when any personal leaves of absence are granted in excess of three consecutive months. So, um, and also just to reference um, uh, section B of the first page, you know, uh, personal leave. I'll highlight this one in particular and everything else following in the article, I'll kind of go through it, skimming a little quicker, um, pinpointing um, or highlighting the um, uh, ultra, ultra important stuff, but everything is pretty much stems off this. So this consider the personal leave uh, section part, some of a tree trunk and then everything else is like branches that kind of come across, come off it in a sense. So a lot of, a lot of it's connected back to that. So, um, so as it says here, let me go and look through some of my notes. Um, on a personal leave, you know, an in-flight crew member may request in writing for a personal leave of access to their respective in-flight base leadership and the leave administrator. Um, with leave granted, in-flight crew members shall keep their seniority and continue accruing um, and, longe and longevity. May be granted up to, up to 12 months and in 30-day increments. Um, Additional extensions, uh, should there need uh, be for one, may also be granted in 30-day increments up to six months. Of course, um, this is to be requested to the in-flight leadership and, um, and leave administrator prior to the end of the initial approved personal leave of absence. Um, total time may not exceed three years. This runs concurrently with FMLA, uh, short-term disability, long-term disability, uh, when applicable, and flight crew members who need to return sooner uh, for whatever reason, because again, life happens, things change. Uh, you got to make a request, must make a request through the leave administrator as well. Um, good thing as always, in flight crew members on personal leave of absence may attend training events such as recurrent without having to return to actual active status in order to avoid uh, dequalification. So that's very good to know. Moving on to uh, bereavement. Um, so this is, um, this is some highlighted info here, bereavement and emergency leave. In the event of a death of an immediate family member, in-flight crew members may take up to five consecutive days of paid time off. Um, this includes actual pairings having to be removed or reserved days that you may have. Uh, documentation will be required by leadership. Um, here we go. So, Definition of immediate family. Um, 
This is mother, father, spouse, child, brother, sister, grandparents. It also includes uh, spouse, family, or your otherwise registered domestic partner, uh, their children, uh, mother, father, uh, brother, sister, grandparents, uh, step relatives, or, you know, relatives by adoption, uh, legal dependents. All this, all this is included in this definition of what is considered immediate family, a uh, definite immediate family, and the event of bereavement or emergency leave needing to be extended, it may be granted, you know, however, this will be paid by the company, but you can utilize your PTO, VPTO, um, anything not covered in all the above regarding emergency leave. Um, once again, uh, referencing PTO, VPTO may be utilized for serious situations with the approval of the director of in-flight or their designee. Uh, military service, um, it's pretty much a no questions asked type ordeal. Um, shout out to all our military personnel. Thank you for your service. An in-flight crew member will be granted military service leave in accordance with the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Act. Family and medical leave, so FMLA. An in-flight crew member will be granted um, this leave in accordance with the Family and Medical Leave Act. An in-flight crew member on FMLA must use their PTO, VPTO, for the time missed. Moving along, medical leave of absence. As soon as an in-flight crewman becomes aware that they can't perform, unable to perform flight duties for more than second, seven consecutive days due to sickness, uh, disability, um, injury sustained, uh, will be granted an unpaid medical leave of absence. You may be required to provide medical documentation for the grants and the event of said leave needing to be ongoing or otherwise extended, again, life happens, the company may require uh, documentation for that as well. Um, it's also very important to know any in-flight crew member who fails to comply with all the above will be deemed uh, resigned from the company. If an in-flight crew member may remain on medical leave for up to six to up to three years, which may be extended in, in accordance with ADA, Americans Disabilities Act, this will run concurrently with FMLA, short-term disability, and long-term disability. Parental leave of absence. An in-flight crew with at least 90 days of service to the company um, may request up to 12 months of parental leave following birth of or adoption of a child. Uh, most fall within the, must, it must fall within the 12 months following birth or adoption date. The request is to be submitted to the leave administrator. Again, um, referencing our personal leave info and details, you have to request these leaves um, and it must be submitted to the leave administrator within 30 days of uh, date of birth or adoption of the child. Of the child. Um, and of course, documentation to, uh, to provide will be such a birth certificate with our, or adoption paperwork. As is the case with personal leave, um, you, may, you may attend training. Uh, to avoid DQAL status without having to return to active status. Um, so that's always good to know. And then flight crewmen may use PTO, VPTO for, to compensate um, pay during the, during the leave. Extensions if, need, if needed must be requested prior to the end of the initial date of the return of, of excuse me, extend, extensions if needed, must be requested prior to the end of the initial date of return for approval. So again, just being proactive in that aspect. And if needing to return sooner, because life happens, you know, requests a prior date, um, once again, must be requested and approved to the uh, leave, leave administrator of the company. Another important note, uh, jury duty, court appearance leave, uh, notify the company as soon as possible of pay of any impending jury duty, it's written proof, of days required um, to be available. If required to attend jury duty, it is credited, it is credited at five hours per day. If, if this is if the absence is known before the bid award, the monthly bid award is, is, um, is pushed out to us. And let me see, it will count towards, it will count towards premium pay. So once again, if you are actually required for duty duty, it'll be credited at five hours per day if the absence is known prior to the monthly bid award and will be 
and will count towards premium pay. If jury duty notices are received after the monthly bid award is, um, is out, then you'll be paid for the value of whatever pairing was having to be removed from your schedule and will compute toward minimum pay guarantee and premium pay. Reserve days removed for jury duty are not credited, but they are included in the monthly guarantee for your line. Anytime miss for jury duty, court summons or subpoenas will not, won't affect your attendance or record with the company. Union leave, so one here to know. Uh, request by the union president, uh, requested by the union president of the local and in-flight crew will be granted a leave of absence to accept a full-time position with the union, either local or international, and shall continue to accrue seniority and will be considered an active crew member and will retain company benefits and privileges throughout. Um, accessibility to our websites. Um, crew member I leave shall have access to MyD Travel, uh, company email, uh, BCSS, Flick, uh, PBS, our bidding systems, and uh, and the QDLs to do our modules for recurrence. Um, any uh, in-flight crew member on leave will be required to re to maintain a standing bid in your system bid. So we obviously, I'm, I'm based in Orlando. My system bid will continue to show MCO unless I otherwise wish to choose it. But I will always have to have that base there submitted into the system bid while out on leave. Returning from leave, um, so if I go out on leave, I return automatically to the base I was in when I took my leave, unless again, I make that change. Otherwise in the system bid, you shall, re and you shall resume getting paid. So an infant will resume getting paid the actual date they return to work. That's when your pay resumes. And of course, good to note, if you fail to return from any leave, you will be deemed resigned from the company. So highlighting with an unpaid leave, uh, again, VPTO, PTO and VPTO may be used unless otherwise provided herein. Time missed from work on an approved leave will not affect, again, um, just to highlight that, any time missed while out on any leave will not affect your attendance. And you will continue to retain and accrue your seniority unless otherwise provided where, um, herein. And the event of crew member is subjected to um, this is a 10 to one, you know, and obviously we would hope not to not to be in set positions, but you know, things happen in the event an inflect room subject subject to a hijacking, a sabotage, an act of terrorism, a war, or involved in an accident and requiring emergency evacuation where slide or slides are deployed on the aircraft, then you will receive seven consec seven con uh, scheduled working days of leave of absence with pay. Um, inflect rooms on leave, except for any type of medical leave of absence may may but are not required to complete QDLs in order to avoid the qualification without having to return to active status. Again, that's always good to note. And all light duty assignments shall be mutually agreed upon by the company and then flight crew members. So try my best to kind of run through that. Again, this is one of those articles, you know, life happens every day and it varies depending on the circumstances. Some of these things we can we can see coming, you know, so we prepare for whether it be a parental leave, you know, a military leave, we got our papers coming, we know our papers are coming to, to be uh, deployed and so on and so forth. But, you know, um, a lot of things happen when we're not ready for, it, you know, so it's good. Like I said, I think uh, this should be of uh, extreme importance and we always implore you obviously to read through the entire TA, but especially during articles like this, like I said, where it should run, um, equally across the board with the level of importance, you know, so thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Ernesto. As a housekeeping note, um, again, when he was reading through the section of C, bereavement and emergency leave, please note that the um, company and the union did codify um, family members and expanded it much more in order to meet the diversity that we do have in our work group as it relates to how families are created and made. Um, so these, this is a codified, um, number, bullet point number three is very codified and I just want to memorialize that for this specific town hall. Um, so our next article unpacking is going to come from Stacy. Stacy's going to do Article 17 commuter policy, which um, had a pretty expansive change, and she's going to go through the details of that. I'm going to hand it to Stacy. Stacy represents our JFK negotiating team. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so commuter policy is um, 
again, fortunately for us at JetBlue, one of those policies that uh, it does affect all of us, it is uh, now in our contract protected for all of us because at many airlines, um, you have more occurrences to use your commuter policy as far as the numbers go, but the instances in which you can use it and the, uh, and the, is much less and the burden of proof is often much higher. So we have a really fantastic uh, policy here that is within our contract. We have expanded on it as part of this contract. Um, to start off with, an IFC must have notified crew services at least 30 minutes prior to their scheduled report time. You're gonna call them up, you're going to request a UNA and you're going to tell them it is for commuting difficulties. Um, you are expected to continue to base unless otherwise granted permission to do so. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and once you arrive in base, you're going to call crew services. Um, and I have who contacts their in-flight supervisor within 24 hours of the original report time. Uh, they are going to have that, uh, incident recorded to an OOP. So that's the, that's kind of the gist of how it works. Um, 30 minutes or, or more prior, obviously give as much notice as you can. Um, it's a UNA, but you tell them it's for commuting challenges and within 24 hours you contact your supervisor. If you are unable to continue to base, you are going to contact your supervisor about that and you're going to provide documentation as to why you can't continue to your base. Um, if you are commuting by air, um, and this is a great thing, again, so many carriers have so many, you know, just almost ridiculous stipulations. You know, you have to be with more than one airport is if you're going to run from one airport to another or, you know, multiple flights showing proof that you were listed. Um, we have to have proof of a primary and a backup flight. And that is the backup is only for cities in which there is more than one flight a day. So if there's only one flight a day, you don't have to have backup. You don't have to um, show that you traveled to another airport um, or anything like that. Um, and again, you're just gonna notify them as soon as possible and you're gonna notify them of your location in case they are able to tell you, stay put, stay where you are, we can assign you something there um, because it's senseless to waste your whole day sitting, uh, trying to get on a flight when they can just give you an assignment. Um, if you're using transportation other than air to commute, this is again, an area where we shine. Um, I'm a local and I like knowing that if, um, my car breaks down and thankfully my car doesn't do that anymore, but I used to have a Fiat and we all know what that means. So um, we are covered by this article. Your, your train is stopped, your car has broken down, uh, whatever the case may be, same rules apply and you're going to provide documentation. So that can be the uh, train schedule, traffic reports, photos, news reports, take a screenshot, that's your documentation. Um, a nice benefit of this is during a critical coverage period, you can still convert an OOP to Stacy. Did we lose her? I think she has a bad connection. Maybe, I don't know, maybe her service went down or something because she's frozen on my screen. Everybody else is moving though. Do, 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 do. She may have to restart her Zoom, unfortunately. Stacy. I'm gonna text her really quick. Yeah, I did so too because she probably doesn't even notice she's just continuing on. So okay, well, she's muted herself. So uh and she was almost done with her article. Um basically she was talking about the ground transportation. That's letter D, base commuter exception policies. This is new and also codified. Um, there have been issues in the past Hi. with you got it? Are you back yet? Nope, she's not. 
There have been issues in the past with ground transportation as it related being out of position, and this is now um, codified and written out and expanded in a new TA2. Stacy, are you back yet? All right. Um, Thank you. While we're, while we're waiting yeah. for Stacy, I can just, I think she was discussing the, the fact that our, uh, when she lost the connection, was discussing the fact that our commuter policy that we were able to, to codify into the agreement has modes of transportation other than just commuting by air, which right. is to our, uh, to our commuter policy, something that we really wanted to uh, fight hard to protect most other uh, uh, flight no, attendants. don't have that. Yeah. only have the uh, commute by air provisions. So right. any, any in-flight crew member at JetBlue is a commuter uh, because we all have to get to work one way or another. And all of those modes of transportation are covered under our commuter policy. So, uh, um, and I didn't, don't know if she got to the fact that we gained an extra- uh, uh, OP. Yeah, that was gonna be my housekeeping note. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that was gonna be my housekeeping note. Um, so again, there was a split off between air commuting and ground commuting. Stacy was talking about the ground commuting. That is new and also codified. And that is a huge I, one for our group. Are you back now? Am I in? Okay, yes. So you're always, you're you're almost done, we're in the home stretch. Okay, so we, we have been able to uh, commute by ground and have that apply as an OOP. Um, that is something that we were able that we were able to do when we were able to codify it. Um, and what I was saying, I, I hope um, that it, it came through, but in case it didn't, uh, train delay, uh, traffic report, photos, news reports, anything of that nature, you take a screenshot, you take a picture of what's going on, and that does count as your documentation. Um, was I, so I was cut off before I got to the critical coverage. Is that, so that is new. Uh, so if you, if you're in a critical coverage period, we said, it's insane that you can't use an OOP. Often the, the situation causing the critical coverage is what's preventing you from getting to work. Uh, holiday schedules or, um, you know, the, the level three that's causing the, the IRAP. Uh, so once in a rolling 12 month period, you can recode your uh, critical coverage to, uh, or your UNA to an OOP during a critical coverage. Um, now for reserves, uh, you are required to continue into base if you call out and uh, use the OOP. Uh, for line holders, you will either rejoin your assignment, reassign to something within your footprint. Um, if there's nothing within your footprint, then they can go two hours, up to two hours outside of your footprint. But again, that is grievable because if you can show that they were parents within the footprint, then that is improperly assigned if they put you outside of it. You will not be, for reserve or line holder, you will not be assigned to a red eye if you did not have one. That's a protection that we have throughout this contract, but we just wanted to remind everyone as part of this article. Um, you can be assigned RSL. You cannot be assigned to airport standby as a line holder unless you concur. Um, or you can be released by crew services if there is reserve coverage and uh, you can use PTO to cover the balance. Um, again, if you were unable to We are freezing again. Uh, yeah, she may need to reboot at this point. Okay, so she is going to reboot. Ernesto, can you ask her to reboot her, her machine for me via text? Thank you. Uh, so that pretty much covers um, OOP. The only other housekeeping notes that I have that Brendan touched upon is there is one extra OOP that is written into this TA2 um, versus what we have currently. And then there was the codifying of the ability to serve out your OOP at a different station with uh, crew service approval. That actually is written and codified in the TA2. Usually people like me who are commuting um, can sometimes beg crew services if you're out of position to not have to commute up into base in the state and the station that you're at. Now this language is actually in the contract and you don't have to, um, it's an available option of empowerment for everyone. So 
I'm going to wrap up commuter policy. We'll circle back to Stacy on the clarifying section if she has anything else to add. And we're actually going to move on to our next article unpacking for the sake of making up a little bit of time. That's going to be Article 14, moving expenses. I'm going to hand that off to Dee, who just turned off her video, but she's definitely going to come back. <laughs> I'm back. I'm just trying to unmute myself. <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. And I can say that we are going to discuss moving expenses. We're very excited that we were able to get this in our agreement because formally uh, what our ISM states is a very limited policy that JetBlue may pay moving expenses in extraordinary cases, such as an involuntary transfer, and they do not pay for moving expenses for a voluntary base transfer. However, on Article 14, moving expenses, we all know that as we grow, the possibility of uh, new bases opening is most likely to happen. So we wrote this article to provide for our in-flight crew members to get paid and to get days off. So it's on page 74, Article 14, and um, we can start with uh, letter A. In-flight crew members transferring bases and moving for reasons other than those listed in this article shall be entitled to the following, provided that the move meets the requirements outlined in this article. So we can be assured that we will have company paid moving eligibility if you're awarded a new base within six months of opening, if you're displaced, including voluntary displacement out of your current base, or should you be furloughed if you're recalled to a base other than the one from which you were furloughed. There are paid move qualifications and they are uh, not complicated, but you would have to understand that to be eligible for moving expenses, you must move your permanent residence and provide written documentation of such the move that it, the distance would have to be 50 miles or more. You'd have to end up both within a 150 mile radius and closer to your awarded base. You'd have to complete the move within 12 months and the original permanent residence on record cannot be located within the excuse me, within the 50 mile radius of the new base. If you were moving to a co-base area, it would have a 150 mile radius drawn around the primary airport. You'll also be entitled to moving days. Travel time will be allowed at the rate of one calendar day for each 350 miles that you're moving. If you elected not to move immediately, you could take your uninterruptible days off at any time within the 12 month effective date of your bid. There is also a pay guarantee in the bid period which you would take the uninterruptible days. You would be paid five hours per day regardless of whether the time is pre-blocked or not. There are additional allowances for moves at the company expense. The company shall arrange for transportation of household goods up to a maximum of 14,000 pounds. For a voluntary move to a new base, the cost to the company for transportation of household goods is capped at $5,600. Receipts must be provided. The in-flight crew member may utilize a one-time positive space travel over the lines of the company for the in-flight crew member and the eligible family members. If an in-flight crew member elects to move his or her household goods himself, you would be eligible for a $3,000 lump sum. The company shall provide the cover of cost of shipping of one car. The company shall provide or reimburse with, with receipts the following en route expenses, gas mileage reimbursed at IRS standard, per diem of $59, en route hotels to a maximum of $100. There is also eligibility for paid moves not moving. So 
you can see that this is a big win for us. As new bases open and as people choose to uh, maybe possibly move to another area that they might like better than where they're living, you now have moving expenses. Perfect, thank you, Dee. We're gonna move into our items to clarify are correct. We do have one item to clarify. Um, that actually is also gonna come from Stacy, and she had one snag left as it related to our Camira policy. So I'm gonna hand it back to Stacy, and we're gonna see. Thank you. Crossing our fingers, this works this time. Give me a nod, Taisha, if, if I'm working. Okay, great. So uh, I'll assume that I left off at the um, three OOP occurrences in a rolling 12 month period. And we have the base commuter exception policies. And these are for the JFK air train, the Boston Chelsea bridge. Those are as they are today. If you are stuck on the air train or you are um, stuck behind the, uh, the bridge opening after you have already swiped through. Um, you're not gonna be held accountable those. You're not gonna get a report late as long as you did so uh, 45 minutes prior, because of course, if you were within uh, 45 minutes of your report time and, and you were there, you weren't gonna make it anyway. So that's, um, you know, that's a reasonable uh, limitation there. And we added that in other bases with their own transportation within terminals. So you won't be limited just to Boston or JFK for this benefit. If there's an internal um, transportation system, uh, you're not going to be held accountable in the same way. Uh, and that, you know, something like Newark's version of the air train or um, MCO's uh, shuttle that goes between the terminals that comes to mind. So that's an additional protection there. And um, something that we wanted to clarify because we're seeing a lot of talk about it on the um, non-disciplinary grievances. Again, yesterday we said that that's what holds the company accountable to us and that's what holds them accountable to the contract and we're not used to having that uh that is something completely foreign to us so everyone says well how well what you know how are we going to hold them accountable how is this going to work where it says um you know unreasonable how do we prove that if it says um you know if their software isn't working then what well they can't just have su systems that don't work um Nothing is perfect. Nothing works 100% of the time. Things malfunction. That is understandable. That's why that clause exists. It is not meant to be used on a daily or monthly basis. Um, at that point, it's a violation of the contract. Um, and, you know, we all know uh, how long it takes to get from one place to another. You know, you can prove that. That's provable. And everybody knows somebody who is the FBI the amateur FBI, and we all know how to take a screenshot. And these things are gonna be your evidence. When you see that uh, there's reserves, but they used you when they were supposed to have used reserves up first. When you see that um, you, know, you have an unreasonable connect time and you know that it takes X amount of time to walk from one place to another, um, you, you're gonna see these items, take a screenshot. It's, that's the proof you need. You know, when you, when you say, well, I was calling and I was on hold for two hours and now it's within uh, my call out time. Well, you take a screenshot that you were trying to call and you couldn't get through. Um, you know, we're, the company is going to be required to uh... Okay. Um, so we are going to skip ahead if she gets uh, disconnected again. Um, we are going to move forward to our next part of the section. That is going to be um, num, 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 num. D. There's a question talking about the IBBS. Why is the IBBS still in? Um, still not in our contract. So I'm going to take that, give that question to D. That question was from Jennifer. She'll be answering it. Thank you. Um, all airlines have, oh, thank you, Jennifer, for asking the question. Um, all airlines have additional supplemental manuals and handbooks to define procedures, but no procedure can be in violation of our contract. And I think you had another question here. Let me look here. Yes, although there will be a review of what is being changed, how much control will the union have to stop changes? 
Uh, the union must be notified in advance and we do review every single change. It has to be an agreement and it cannot violate any language in our contract. Example would be like uh, additional critical coverage days. The company would have to prove uh, their case to why they were doing it. It can't be just because um, as they say now, you know, a uh, shortage of crew members. Well, why is there a shortage of crew members? Because you don't hire enough crew members. So there would be a the proof of, uh, once again, as Stacy always says, the proof of burden would be on the company. Um, another example would be uh, if they wanted to change our, our cleaning, uh, our tidying, I should say, if you read in our, our language and it says tidying the aircraft, they couldn't give us a vacuum and say, now you have to clean the aircraft. That's in violation of our contract language. So any changes in the IBBS or any company procedure would be grievable as well under the contract. And uh, her further question uh, asks, are the processes similar to contract negotiations? No, there's no negotiation here. We have a contract. So it's a discussion on the why and the review of the change and the change cannot violate any section of our contract. Jennifer also asks who gets to review the changes before they are made. Our local president who we will elect uh, or his, des his or her, I should say, hers or his designee, any individual member could also file a grievance if they felt this was a violation. All right, I think that's all the questions from Jennifer that was broken up into about four parts. Um, we're going to go back to the first question. And these again are polls that were submitted from the website on um, our b6.tw.org. Um, that is where that is. I'm also, it's two minutes early, but I'm going to have Travis also open up our chat um, for the duration of the 15 minutes with the housekeeping note that all questions that are not answered during this town hall will be rolled over into the next town hall. And again, we apologize for the electronics issues that we're having on this call. Um, not every call town hall is perfect and not all internet works completely correctly every day, all day. So again, we thank you for your patience with that. We're going to go back to um, Stacy. This is a Question from Carolyn, I believe after 11 years of employment, we do not accrue any more PTO hours. So I'm wondering if there will be an increase in PTO and if it will be retroactive. So I'm gonna give this question to Stacy. Okay, and I'm going to start by apologizing profusely. Um, I think that's my issues today speak to uh, what I was saying about everything malfunctions sometimes. And um, I hope you will be forgiving of me. Um, the question of PTO and uh, increases and um, how that's working, um, we, we've just, we really wanted to see some improvements um, and some increases. We, uh, we are the lowest in the company. We were not up to industry andru, uh, standard on PTO and VPTO. Um, we, were, we were just sorely lacking. We hadn't seen any increase ever. So what we were able to do here, and I am going to look at my paper a lot. Um, so I, I do apologize for that, but it's, it's all numbers. So, um, and for those of you who know me, I did math before coffee. So, you know, I love you all. Um, so the increases we're looking at here are uh, effective January 23. If, if you are at uh, year five through nine, you're going to be gaining uh, an additional eight hours overall total accrual between your PTO and VPTO. Um, however, because we broke out the changes of, uh, of the years differently, if you were a five year before you were on the zero to five scale, now you're on the five to nine. So at year five, that year you bump up by 26 hours of total accrual for that year. Um, 10 to 19, again, 10 um, is in a new, is in its own new bracket now up with the uh, 19. So if you are 10 to 19, that's a 17 hour bump total over the course of the year, except for the 10 and they gain 35 additional hours over what they would have made on the, uh, the old company scale. And for those at 20 plus years, that's an additional 34 hours over the course of the year. 
And then when we get into 2024, 20, now that's the, uh, the top of the scale for this contract. And um, yes, it is a, a bit less flexible when you look at the PTO hours alone. And I'm not gonna argue the flexibility because if that is the most important thing to you, then um, you know that's, that is your priority. I'm not here to argue your priority by any means. But uh, if we are looking at the sheer numbers and accrual, um, if you are in the five to nine bracket, that's a 16 hour gain over the course of the year, except for the five year, uh, they gain 34 over what is the current policy. Um, if you are in the 10 to 19 bracket, it's 33 hours more over the course of the year, except for the 10 years, they are gaining 51. And if you are in the 20 plus year bracket, you are uh, at a total accrual of 212 hours, which is an increase of 68 hours over our current policy. That basically covers your entire two weeks of required vacation. Um, to just do a little bit of math on what that means financially, um, as opposed to just talking about in terms of hours, let's talk about it in terms of money. If you are on the, um, the straight pay scale at 10 years in the year 2024, and that's just two short years from now. Um, you take that because you're bumping up by 51 hours from our current scale for the 10 years. And that is gonna be 2,491 additional dollars that come to you that year. Um, and if you are at the top of the scale uh, top street pay in the year 2024. Um, you multiply that by 68 hours and that is an additional $3,990 that's coming to you that year as a result of PTO pay. And again, PTO, um, VPTO, that's, you know, that's your additional pay combined. Your VPTO um, can be picked up over so if you have a VPTO taken, but you don't need the time off or your plans changed, uh, it doesn't have to be a PTX two months in advance. You can do your, uh, your picking up at any time you choose to do so. Uh, you can pick up from the trade board. You can pick up from open time. You can pick up premium parents if they're available. And that will be on top of your vacation pay. And as, uh, as today, you can do PTX with a full line uh, notify them two months in advance. So you can say you do max bid, that's 100. Then you get your, uh, your week of vacation at 35. And then you can pick up over that on top of that. So um, you can really increase um, your compensation in that way with our new scale. All right, thank you, Stacy. Um, our next question is from John. Not a contract question, but would like to know the history of why all crew members do not get paid for their first hour of their shift. I'm gonna throw this to Ernesto. Thank you, Ernesto. Look at that, just to repeat the question, was that, um, was that from John? Yep, that's from John. Not a contract question, but would you yeah, like, okay. would like to know the history of all crew members that do not get paid for the first hour of their Gotcha. I, I always felt that way myself, granted, and that didn't come from uh, previous airline experience. Um, like uh, like D, for instance, you know, so I remember I used to always think the same thing, like, you know, when I come to work, you know, I'm like, what if, you know, I, sh I show up to work at a, an hour before my report time, you know, and my flight is late two hours. I'm like, geez, I'm standing here, like, not getting paid for this time. So, but I think it's an industry thing, you know. Um, from the beginning, you know, of both flight attendants and pilot contracts, uh, crews will not were only pay for actual flight time. Um, yeah, actual flight time. Um, and I think uh, the reason for that is because since pilots and flight attendants usually make a higher average, hourly wage in comparison to your average um, hourly wage employee. Um, that's why we only get paid for actual flight time. However, uh, most contracts, including uh, this TA of ours, um, have negotiated rigs to provide guarantees for our time while on duty when we're not actual flying, actually flying. So hope that helps. 
All right, thank you, Ernesto. Our next question also um, is from Greg. How long after December 6th will this go into effect? That's also a question for you. Um, sure, uh, I think I heard Greg. Uh, thanks for the question, Greg. Um, I think you meant like how long after, how long after the contract uh, comes or the voting comes to close. So voting is December 6th, opening, closing December 13th. Uh, I guess we'll find our results. Uh, 13th or 14th, is it? Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, nonetheless, pretty much um, most provision will go into effect immediately, you know? Um, so, you know, on the 15th, I come to work and I'm on the contract, you know? Um, some other some other uh, stuff may take a short time for programming, for instance, like uh, use, for example, like uh, Crew Flex, you know, since it'll be sunsetting, you know, they gotta, re you know, program the system to get the reduced credit line into the mix and so on and so forth. So, I'm, so it may take a little time, you know, but otherwise, you know, we show up 15 to work, you know, contracted and flight crew members. So. All right, thank you. As a housekeeping note, if you look in your letter agreement number four basis, that is also another one that is an exception to that immediately goes into effect. Um, that one has its own letter of agreement as it relates to um, the transition from EWR not being a code base any further. So that concludes the questions that we're taking from the website. Um, here is one question that is a poll from a previous town hall that is up for grabs for any of our negotiating team members. Will there be a way to look at your points without reaching out to a department lead or a supervisor? This is going to D actually, I see your name now. I'm sorry, Taisha. I was reading a question in the chat. So I wasn't paying attention. Where are we at? Last question on the page. Will there be a way to look at your points without reaching out to a team leader supervisor? Sorry. Yes, I know the answer to that. So currently, uh, we do have an app uh, on our um, iPads, which I had right here. I believe it's called the Power App. And they send out a picture of, of what you have available. And you can also um, update that when you want by reaching out via email to a uh, supervisor, which I just did recently to find out if I was updated um, in that extra incentive point that we that we got. And they answered me right away. So you, you don't have to go in and talk to them. You can just shoot them an email. And they may update the app someday to have the availability to look at it for current language. All right, and that concludes the uh, most of the agenda from uh, and the polls from the previous town hall. There are questions being asked. We are able to answer one of those, or rather, I answered one of those that were in the chat, um, only because I knew that, particularly off the off the top of my head, as a commuter for the past six and a half years. Shadia Cano, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Just to clarify, if we end up getting copied, and I'm going to think that copied means coded as OOP. Can we choose not to use our PTO to cover the credit hours loss? My answer was um, page 85-3. D, if released from the pairing, the IFC shall have the option to debit her or his PTO for all credit loss um, to include uh, the entire value of the OSP, OSP meaning of um, original uh, OSP. So basically this is a little word bigger picture, which I talked about and how to read your contract in our contract 101 video. Um, the word shall have the option allows for you to, it basically translates to crew services has to give you the option and you get to choose from the option that crew services give you. So you don't have to use your PTO unless you give consent for it to be used. Um, when crew services op uh, offers it to you or when someone offers it to you. So um, that's something that is also something that can be grievable. If you find that you did an OOP and your PTO was deducted without your consent, you can also go back and grieve it and have that um, fixed due to how the language is in the contract. So that seems to be all the questions. Um, there was another one. Are we, as a negotiating team, do we want to push that to the next town hall? Where is the other one that I saw? This one is to Dee. I spoke to Dee regarding this late the other night, but she answered me as if I was calling in sick. 
If I PTO a trip into open time or the PTO UTO drop window and pick up a trip over it, do I get my PTO back to my bank? I see it clearly states the reserve and OBO do not, but does a normal core member still get their PTO back in their bank? I couldn't find any language on this. This can be probably pushed to the next town hall because we are running out of time. So Brett, thank you for that question. Um, please come to the next town hall, which I believe is, I'm going to say off the top of my head, November 27th. Um, and that question will be answered at that time, unless D reaches out to you personally, because that also is a protocol too. If a question um, can be answered outside of a town hall, they can get back to you privately in order to answer that question, then that question published at a later date. So we are going to close the town hall a little early. I'm giving you back three minutes of your time at this morning. Um, thank you again for your patience as it relates to all of the uh, disruptions of our internet service with some of us. And we appreciate you all showing up and we appreciate all of the negotiating team members that were in attendance to this call, giving their time and labor to answer these questions. So good morning and we will see you at the next town hall. Have a good morning, bye.